and welcome back to Fan Fatales, a member of the Real Fans Network. I'm Emma. And I'm Gabby. And in this episode, we're going to be taking a deep dive into how Marvel Comics began and where they are now. Now, unfortunately, we don't have time to cover the entire history of just like Marvel as an entity, as like including MCU and all that stuff. So we'll do a separate episode on the MCU just because there's so much information. Again, there's always a possibility for a history of the MCU episode. Also, before we begin, I would like to say that our hearts go out to the family and friends of comic book artists Neil Adams and George Perez. Neil Adams passed away on April 28th and primarily worked on DC Comics, but was a freelance uh, artist on some X-Men comics. And George Perez passed away on May 6th and came to prominence in the 1970s, penciling the Avengers for Marvel Comics and returned to the franchise in the 1990s. Yeah. So our hearts go out to them. them. And their families and and friends. Their families and all of that. Yeah. Jazz. So. All that jazz. (laughs) I know. That's like a very somber way to start this episode. And, uh, yeah. and also, ladies and gents, and everybody else, this is this is the first episode Emma and I have recorded in probably two weeks. Yeah. It took us about two weeks to get here. And uh, not going to lie, it's probably going to be a little chaotic. We're going to try to stay as much on track as we can, but I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to be a little much. Hey, just wait for the episode we're recording tomorrow. <laughs> We'll get there. That's tomorrow's problem, yeah. not today. <laughs> Let's get this started. Okay. So, um, in 1939, pulp magazine publisher Martin Goodman created the company later known as Marvel Comics under the name Timely Publications. Goodman, who had started with a Western pulp in 1933, was expanding into the emerging and by then already highly popular new medium of comic books. Launching his new line from his existing company's offices at 330 West 42nd Street, New York City, he officially held the titles of editor, managing editor, and business manager with Abraham Goodman, who was his brother. Um, He was officially listed as publisher. Timely's first publication, Marvel Comics, issue number one, cover dated October 1939, included the first appearance of Carl Burgos' android superhero, The Human Torch, and the first appearance of Bill Everett's anti-hero, Namor the Submariner, among other features. Yeah. The company's first true editor, writer-artist Joe Simon, teamed with artist Jack Kirby to create one of the first patriotically-themed superheroes, Captain America who was introduced in Captain America Comics issue number one, which was released on March of 1941. It, too, proved a hit with sales of nearly one million. Goodman formed Timely Comics, Inc., beginning with comics cover dated of April 1941 or spring 1941. While no other Timely character would achieve the success of these three characters, Some notable heroes, many of which continue to appear in modern-day retcon appearances and flashbacks, include The Wizard, Miss America, The Destroyer, The Original Vision, and The Angel. Goodman's wife, Goodman hired his wife's 16-year-old cousin, Stanley Lieber, as a general office assistant in 1939. When editor Simon left the company in late 1941, Goodman made Lieber, by then writing pseudonymously, pseudonymously, is that how you say that word? I know the word pseudonym, and I, like, I know that, but (laughs) this is, like, a terrible, oh, gosh. Um, okay. Writing under the pseudonym as Stanley. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Yeah. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) Emma said it. Yeah. Writing under the pseudonym of Stanley. (laughs) Um, interim editor of the comics line. Sorry. Goodman made Stanley interim editor of the comics line. In a position Lee kept for decades, except for three years during his military service in World War II. Lee wrote extensively for Timely, contributing to a number of different titles, and also serving as Amazing the most... cameo appearance appearances yes. until his 
untimely passing. Well, I don't think it was untimely. I just untimely, think it was tragic. No. Tragic, yeah. Until his, yeah. He was yeah. pretty old. Yeah. <laughs> so it would have been different if he was, like, in his 60s. But yeah. he was, like, in his 90s. Yeah. I mean, he but started it was in still World War so II. so sad. Oh, so sad. It literally, it rocked the entire Marvel Comics fandom, MCU, Marvel Comics, everything. Yeah. To their core. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Goodman's business strategy involved having his various magazines and comic books published by a number of corporations all operating out of the same office and with the same staff. One of the shell companies through which Timely Comics was published was named Marvel Comics by at least Marvel Mystery Comics issue number 55, which was May of 1944, as well some comics covers such as All Surprise Comics issued number 12, Winter of 1946 to 47, were labeled a marvelous or a Marvel magazine many years before Goodman would formally adopt the name in 1961. The post-war American comic market saw superheroes falling out of fashion. So Goodman's comic line dropped them for the most part and expanded to a wider variety of genres than even Timely had published, featuring horror, westerns, humor, talking animals, mams, adventure dramas, giant monsters, crimes, and war comics. Uh, They later added jungle books, romance titles, espionage, and even medieval adventures, Bible stories, and sports. So really covering everything you could cover Mm -hmm. the first modern comic books under the marvel comics brand were the science fiction anthology journey into mystery issue number 69 and the teen humor title patsy walker issue number 95 both cover dated june of 1961 which each displayed an mc box on its cover then, in the wake of DC Comics' success in reviving superheroes in the late 1950s and ni- early 1960s, particularly with The Flash, Green Lantern, Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Green Arrow, and many other members of the Justice League of America team, Marvel followed suit. In 1961, writer-editor Stan Lee revolutionized superhero comics by introducing superheroes designed to appeal to older readers than the predominantly child audiences of the medium, thus ushering what Marvel later called the Marvel Age of Comics. Modern Marvel's first superhero team, the titular stars of the Fantastic Four, issue number one, released in November of 1961, broke convention with other comic book archetypes by the time of the time by squabbling and holding grudges both deep and petty and eschewing anonymity for secret identities in favor of celebrity status. Subsequently, Marvel Comics developed a reputation for focusing on characterization and adult issues to a greater extent than most superhero comics before them, a quality which the new generation of older readers appreciated. This applied to the Amazing Spider-Man title in particular, which turned out to be Marvel's most successful book. Its young hero suffered from self-doubt and mundane problems like any other teenager, which was something that many readers could identify with. Yeah. I love Spider-Man. We'll get into that with the Marvel History episode. Mm -hmm. Uh, Or Marvel Cinematic Universe History episode, rather. Marvel often presented flawed Superheroes, freaks, and misfits, unlike the perfect, handsome, athletic heroes found in previous traditional comic books. Some Marvel heroes looked like villains and monsters, such as the Hulk and the Thing. This naturalistic approach even extended into topical politics. Comics historian Mike Benton also noted, in the world of rival DC Comics Superman comic books, communism did not exist. Superman rarely crossed national borders or involved himself in political disputes. From 1962 to 1965, there were more communists in Marvel Comics than on the subscription list of Pravda. Communist agents attack Ant-Man in his laboratory, Red Henchmen jump the Fantastic Four on the moon, and Viet Cong guerrillas take pot shots at Iron Man. Yeah. 
And just for those of you who don't know, Pravda was like a communist newspaper. It was the official newspaper of the Communist Party in Soviet Russia. Yeah. Um, okay. So all these elements struck a chord with the older readers, including college age adults. In 1965, Spider-Man and the Hulk were both featured in Esquire magazine's list of 28 college campus heroes, alongside John F. Kennedy and Bob Dylan. In 2009, writer jo- Jeff Boucher sure, reflected that Superman and DC Comics instantly seemed like boring old Pat Boone. Marvel felt like the Beatles and the British Invasion. It was Kirby's artwork with its tension and psychedelia that made it perfect for the times? Or was it Lee's bravado and melodrama, which was somehow insecure and brash at the same time? In addition to Spider-Man and the Fantastic Four, Marvel began publishing further superhero titles featuring such heroes and anti-heroes as the Hulk and Thor, Ant-Man, Iron Man, the X-Men, Daredevil, the Inhumans, Black Panther, Doctor Strange, Captain Marvel, and the Silver Surfer, and such memorable antagonists as Doctor Doom, Magneto, Galactus, Loki, the Green Goblin, and Doctor Octopus, all existing in a shared reality known as the Marvel Universe, with locations that mirror real-life cities such as New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago. That was a lot of character names. So many. (laughs) But think about how many you recognize, like... They're all recognizable names. Yes. Except There's for not the Silver one... Surfer, I feel. But people know who he is. True. I mean, they made that movie ages ago. Yeah, true. But, like, you know, there's not a name on there that you go, who? Yeah. Like, you you kind of know. Yeah, you at least know if, you, if not the MCU's been having them since, like, 2008. Yeah. Originally, the company's publications were branded with a minuscule MC on the upper right-hand corner of the covers. However, artist-slash-writer Steve Ditko put a larger masthead picture of the title character, The Amazing Spider-Man, on the upper left-hand corner on issue number two that included the series' issue number and the price. Lee appreciated the value of this visual motif and adapted it for the company's entire publishing line. This branding pattern, typically being either a full-body picture of the character's solo titles or a collection of the main character's faces in ensemble titles, would later become the standard for Marvel for decades. Yeah. In 1971, the United States Department of Health, Education, and Welfare approached Marvel Comics editor-in-chief Stan Lee to do a comic book story about drug abuse. Lee agreed and wrote a three-part Spider-Man story portraying drug use as dangerous and unglamorous. However, the industry's self-censorship board, the Comics Code Authority, refused to approve the story because of the presence of narcotics, deeming the context of the story irrelevant. Lee, with Goodman's approval, published the story regardless as The Amazing Spider-Man issues number 96 through 98, um, which were published in May to July of 1971 without the Comics Code seal. The market reacted well to the storyline, and the CCA subsequently revised the code that same year. Goodman retired as publisher in 1972 and installed his own son, Chip, as publisher. Shortly thereafter, Lee succeeded him as publisher and also became Marvel's president for a brief time. That, I phrased that weird, but it's fine. Um, during his time as president, he appointed his associate editor, prolific writer Roy Thomas, as editor-in-chief. Thomas added, Stan Lee presents to the opening page of each comic book. Oh. Also, I love the son's name is Chip, like Beauty and the Beast. But this was pre-Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> I like how that's what you thought, and my thought was like, Chip on your shoulder. I was like, why does that have to do with any of this? You know that I'm a Beauty and the Beast girl. I do know that. Yeah. Um, Marvel was able to capitalize on its successful superhero comics um, of the previous decade by acquiring a new newsstand distributor and greatly expanding its comics, comics line. Marvel pulled ahead of rival DC Comics in 1972 during a time when the price and format of the standard newsstand comic were in flux. 
Goodman increased the price and size of Marvel's November 1971 cover dated comics from 15 cents for 36 pages to, um, total to 25 cents for 52 pages. DC followed suit, but Marvel the following month dropped its comics to 20 cents for 36 pages, offering a lower price product with a higher distributor discount. Which is really interesting how it started at 15 cents for 36 pages, and then they bumped it up to 25 for 52, and then they brought it back down. They were like, oh, we dropped it five cents, but you still only get the same amount as you got before. <laughs> yeah, that is interesting. Right? Yeah. So in the mid-70s, a decline of the newsstand distribution network affected Marvel. Cult hits such as Howard the Duck fell victim to the distribution problems, with some titles reporting low sales when, in fact, the first specialty comic book stores resold them at a later date. But by the end of the decade, Marvel's fortunes were reviving thanks to the rise of direct market distribution, selling through those same comic specialty stores instead of newsstands. Marvel ventured into audio in 1975 with a radio show. Or I'm going to restart that. Sorry, Kara. Marvel ventured into audio in 1975 with a radio series and a record. Both had Stan Lee as narrator. The radio series was Fantastic Four. The record was Spider-Man Rock Reflections of a Superhero concept album for fans. For music fans, rather. I want to listen to it. I want to listen to it to see how it is. I don't know how I feel about this. I want to listen to it. It's it's like in the Into the Spider-Verse film, the like Christmas album that Spider-Man released. <laughs> that exists. I feel like, you can find I it on like, Spotify. I wonder if they have this on Spotify. She's going to look. We'll check back in. Um, moving on. It's Marvel had its... Home. Marvel held its own comic book convention, Marvel Con 75, in spring of 1975, and promised a Marvel Con 76 at the 19. Sorry, and promised a Marvel Con 76. At the end of the 75 event, Stan Lee used a Fantastic Four panel discussion to announce that Jack Kirby, the artist and co-creator of Marvel's most signature characters, was returning to Marvel after having left in 1970 to work for rival DC Comics. It looks like Emma has some news. I found it. She found it. <laughs> and it still has the original cover. Why is that giving me Spider-Man meme vibes? Because it definitely is. I'm going to look It's amazing. It. So I'm we'll link it. it. We'll link it in the description of this episode if you want to go listen to it on Spotify. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah. <laughs> This episode comes out this week. Yeah, I know. <laughs> in October of 1976, Marvel, which already licensed reprints in different countries, including the UK, created a superhero specifically for the British market, Captain Britain, who debuted exclusively in the UK and later appeared in American comics. During Is this, this like time, Captain Carter in that one what if episode? No, it's not. It's a different guy. Okay. Because yeah. you know that that's a huge thing is Captain Carter as Wish Shield yeah. and Wish Serum now. No, this is somebody different. This is Captain Britain. And uh, the character is Brian Braddock is the... It, okay. Not Captain Britain is the alter ego of Brian Braddock. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Captain Britain ex debuted exclusively in the UK and later appeared in American comics. During this time, Marvel and the Iowa-based Register and Tribune Syndicate launched a number of syndicated comic strips, The Amazing Spider-Man, Howard the Duck, Conan the Barbarian, and The Incredible Hulk. None of the strips lasted past 1982, except for The Amazing Spider-Man, which is still being published. Wow. That is a long time. Yeah, in a newspaper, believe it or not. Wow. Yeah, the Iowa-based Register and Tribune Syndicate. Well, hey, if any of our listeners is from Iowa, I would love to see this comic. 
Although I don't know if it's in like just regular the register and regular Tribune. Maybe I don't know. I don't know. Listeners, tell us. Let us know. Send us. Let us know. Send us DMs of Spider Man in your yeah. newspaper. If you yeah. still get a newspaper, do people still get newspapers? I'm sure we could find this because people probably don't get newspapers anymore. I'm sure somebody does. Yeah. If you still get a newspaper, we want to see it. <laughs> um, in 1978, Jim Shooter became Marvel's editor-in-chief. Although a controversial personality, Shooter cured many of the procedural ills at Marvel, including repeatedly missed deadlines. During Shooter's nine-year tenure as editor-in-chief, Chris Claremont and John Byrne's run on the Uncanny X-Men and Frank Miller's run on Daredevil became critical and commercial successes. Shooter brought Marvel into the rapidly evolving direct market, institutionalized creator royalties, starting with the Epic Comics imprint for creator-owned material in 1982, introduced company-wide crossover story arcs with Contest of Champions and Secret Wars, and in 1986 launched the ultimately unsuccessful New Universe line to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the Marvel Comics imprint. Star Comics, a children-oriented line differing from the regular Marvel titles, was briefly successful during this period. In 1986, Marvel's parent, Marvel Entertainment Group, was sold to New World Entertainment, which within three years sold it to Mac Andrews and Forbes, owned by Revlon executive Ronald Perlman in 1989. In 1991, Perlman took MEG, so Marvel Entertainment Group, public. Following the rapid rise of this stock, Perlman issued a series of junk bonds that he used to acquire other entertainment companies secured by MEG stock. And uh, if you don't know, a junk bond is a high-yield bond. So it's a bond that's rated below investment grade by credit rating agencies. I was just about to ask that, so thank you for... It's You're welcome. my question before I even ask. Yeah, junk bonds have a higher risk of default or other adverse credit events. Yeah. But offer higher yields than investment grade bonds in order to compensate for the increased risk. Mm-hmm. So um, basically what it means is it has high risk, high reward. But if you if you if you lose, you lose big. That's what it means basically. Yeah. In 1990, Marvel began selling Marvel Universe cards with trading card ma- maker Skybox International. These were collectible trading cards that featured the characters and events of the Marvel Universe. The 1990s saw the rise of variant covers, cover enhancements, swimsuit issues, and company-wide crossovers that affected the overall continuity of the Marvel Universe. Marvel suffered a blow in early 1992 when seven of its most prized artists, Todd McFarlane, known for his work on Spider-Man, Jim Lee, who worked on X-Men, Rob Liefeld, who was known for X-Force, Mark Silvestri, who worked on Wolverine, Eric Larson, who worked on The Amazing Spider-Man, Jim Valentino, who worked on Guardians of the Galaxy, and Wallace Portacio, I hope I said that right, who worked on Uncanny X-Men, uh, left to form Image Comics. Uh, they left in a deal brokered by Malibu Comics owner Scott Mike Mitchell Rosenberg. Uh, three years later, on November 3rd, 1994, Rosenberg sold Malibu to Marvel. And in purchasing Malibu, Marvel now owned leading standard for computer coloring of comic books that had been developed by Rosenberg and also integrated the Ultraverse line of comics and the Genesis universe into the Marvel's multiverse. Yes. So I was just clicking on Image Universe or Image Comics just to see what they did. Um, they're known for the Walking Dead comics. That's one of their best known publications. That totally makes sense because then you get Marvel zombies. Yeah. Um, it says um, its best known publications include Spawn, Savage Dragon, Witchblade, The Walking Dead, Invincible, Saga, Jupiter's Legacy, and Kick-Ass. Makes sense. Yeah. I just wanted to know what they were, like, known for. Agreed. Because, you know, DC has, like, Batman and Superman, and Marvel has Avengers, X-Men, 
Everyone. I was just gonna say, yeah. Um, I was gonna say Spider Man, Iron Man, Hulk, Captain America, Black Widow, Hawkeye. Yeah. Shall I keep going? <laughs> exactly. In late 1994, Marvel acquired the comic book distributor Heroes World Distribution to use as its own exclusive distributor. As the industry's other major pub- publishers made exclusive distribution deals with other companies, the ripple effect resulted in the survival of only one other major distributor in North America, Diamond Comic Distributors Incorporated. Then, by the middle of the decade, the industry had slumped, and in, ni- er, in, and in December of 1996, MEG filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy um, protection. In early 1997, when Marvel's Heroes World Endeavor failed, Diamond also forged an exclusive deal with Marvel, giving the company its own section of its comics catalog for use. Okay. So I just looked it up. And uh, for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, this means that it is available. this is available to every business, whether organized as a corporation, partnership, or sole proprietorship, and to individuals, although it is most prominently used by corporate entities. Does it say anything else? I'm trying to look. Hold on. Um, see if I was still a when a business, matrix. okay. When a business is unable to service its debt or pay its creditors, the business or its creditors can file with a federal bankruptcy court for protection either under Chapter Seven or Chapter Eleven. So, hmm. they just they couldn't pay people back. I guess. Yeah. Well, that we'll get into it maybe. Um, around this time was probably when they were starting to make Islands of Adventure. I know that was in the 90s. Yeah, it, it probably was, because this is late because 90s, and Islands of Adventure was made mid-90s? I think so, and I think Marvel sold them the rights so they could get money back Yeah, them to... for licensing. Yeah. Because that was the whole, like, that was part of the deal, mm-hmm. as we discussed almost a year ago. At this point oh my gosh <laughs> <laughs> yeah um in 1996 marvel had some of its titles participate in heroes reborn a crossover that allowed marvel to relaunch some of its flagship characters such as the avengers and the fantastic four and outsource them to the studios of two of the former marvel artists turned image comics founders jim lee and rob Liefeld. Ly- uh, the relaunched titles, which saw characters transported to a parallel universe with a history distinct from the mainstream Marvel universe, were a solid success amidst a generally struggling industry. But Marvel discontinued the experiment after a one-year run and returned the characters to the Marvel universe proper. So, the introduction of the multiverse. Wow. Which, you know, is just starting up in the MCU now. Yeah. It is now very, very prominent. Literally, the the weekend that we're recording it is opening weekend opening of weekend. Doctor Strange, the multiverse mm-hmm. of madness. Yep. In 1997, Toy Biz bought Marvel Entertainment Group to end the bankruptcy, forming a new corporation, Marvel Enterprises, with his business partner, Avi Arid, Publisher Bill Nemes? Question mark? Sorry if I got your name wrong. And editor in chief Bob Harris. Toy Biz co owner Isaac Perlmutter helped stabilize the comics line. So our speculations were wrong. <laughs> yeah. Okay, honestly, I kind of forgot. I did the research for this episode literally almost a two month weeks ago. ago. No, two weeks ago. No. Was it a month ago? Did I do this before my trip? I think I did yeah, this before did my trip. Yeah, you did this before your trip because you were supposed to do it, like, right after you got back from your trip and then final stop yeah. for me. Yeah. So, I did this about a month ago. I'm on my so summer I... vacation, guys. I, I'm chilling. Yeah, I still have a few weeks. Um, but <laughs> definitely forgot what happens. So, this is, we're finding out alongside you. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I in see 19- most of these history ones as I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Uh huh. 
Thank you, Wikipedia. Sponsor us. Please. Um, in 1998, the company launched the imprint Marvel Knights, taking place just outside Marvel continuity with better production quality. The imprint was helmed by soon-to-become editor-in-chief Joe Quesada. It featured tough, gritty stories showcasing such characters as the Daredevil, the Inhumans, and Black Panther. With the new millennium, Marvel Comics emerged from bankruptcy and again began diversifying its offerings. In 2001, Marvel withdrew from the Comics Code Authority and established its own Marvel rating system for comics. The first title from this era to not have the code was The X-Force, issue number 119, in October of 2001. Marvel also created new imprints such as MAX, an explicit comic... Um, an explicit content line, and Marvel Adventures developed for child audiences. The company also created an alternate universe imprint, Ultimate Marvel, that allowed the company to reboot its major titles by revising and updating its characters to introduce to a new generation. Some of the company's properties were adapted into successful film franchises, such mm-hmm. as the Men in Black movie series, which was based on a Malibu book starting in 1997, the Blade movie series starting in 1998, the X-Men movie series starting in 2000, and the highest grossing series, Spider-Man, beginning in 2002 with Tobey Maguire. Oh yes. We love you, Tobey. Yes. We'd love to. I, I would love to have any of the spider men to come on our show. If, okay, <laughs> if we got a Spider-Man, I don't care which one, one of them <laughs> on our show, I think I would cry. There we go. New life goal. New life goal. Interview a Spider-Man, any of them. Also Sebastian Stan. Yeah. Also, any of the Marvel actors. Literally any Marvel actor, I think I'd yeah. cry. Yeah. Yeah. I think we could do it. <laughs> what do you think? I think so. Let's I don't do know. It. We'll try. We'll try, but let's 20, do it. Uh, 20, whatever this, 2023 will be our year. Yes. Well, it's, next year will be our year. Next year of podcasting, it will be our year. I don't know. Podcast year two will be our year. Yes. <laughs> Let's go. Okay. Woo, we're all pumped. <laughs> Marvel's Conan the Barbarian title was canceled in 1993 after 275 issues, while the Savage Sword of Conan magazine had lasted 235 issues. Marvel published additional titles, including a miniseries in two. 2000 for a total of 650 issues and conan was picked up by dark horse comics three years later in late 2007 the company launched marvel digital comics unlimited a digital archive of over 2500 back issues available for viewing for a monthly or annual subscription fee At the December 2007 New York Anime Fest, the company announcement that Del Rey Manga would publish two original English-language Marvel manga books featuring the X-Men and Wolverine to hit the stands in spring of 2009. In 2009, Marvel Comics closed its open submissions policy in which the company had accepted unsolicited samples from aspiring comic book artists saying the time-consuming review process had produced no suitable um, suitable professional work. The same year, the company commemorated its 70th anniversary dating to its inception as Timely Comics by issuing the one-shot Marvel Mystery Comics 70th Anniversary Special, issue number one, and a variety of other special issues. On August 31st of 2009, the Walt Disney Company announced it would acquire Marvel Comics' parent corporation, Marvel Entertainment, for cash and stock deal worth approximately $4 billion. Billion with a B, people. Yeah. It was one Um, of the big Disney purchases mm -hmm. at the time. Yup. That, Star Wars. Yep. All around the same time. Yeah. Yeah which, if necessary, would be adjusted at closing, giving Marvel shareholders $30 and 
0.745 Disney shares for each Marvel share they owned. So if you had, let's say for numbers sake, oh gosh, if you had 100 Marvel shares, you would now have $300, nope, $3,000 and 75 Disney shares. Yes. Um, as of 2008, Marvel and its major longtime competitor, DC Comics, shared over 80% of the American comic book market. Not surprised. I'm not either. Again, I feel like all the superheroes I know are either Marvel or DC. Agreed. Except for the only other ones that I know that are not Marvel or DC are the Umbrella Academy, which are yeah. Dark Horse. Yeah. But other than that, you never hear about it. No. Besides, like, Webtoon, which has become popular nowadays. But they're not comic they're comics. They're not comics, comics. They're not, like, printed. They made a book. Yeah. But it's not the same. Um, Marvel discontinued its Marvel Adventures imprint in March of 2012 and replaced them with a line of two titles connected to the Marvel Universe TV block. Also in March, Marvel announced its Marvel Re-Evolution initiative that included Infinite Comics, a line of digital comics, Marvel AR, a software application that provides an augmented reality experience to readers, and Marvel Now, a relaunch of, the com- of most of the company's major titles with different creative teams. Marvel Now also saw the debut of new flagship titles, including Uncanny Avengers and all-new X-Men. In April of 2013, Marvel and other Disney conglomerate components began announcing joint projects with ABC, a Once Upon a Time, one of my favorite shows, graphic novel was announced for publication in September, which I actually read, and it was real good, honestly. (laughs) I loved it so much. Of course you did. Of course I did. I read everything once upon a time at the time because mm-hmm. they were coming out with novels and stuff. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it on a future TV episode. That'll um, be your next That'll be your next birthday episode. I'm not making you watch all seven seasons. We'll talk about season one. Yeah. <laughs> I that, can do that. That is the best season. Ask Kara. Sebastian Stan is in the first season. I know. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. With Disney, Marvel announced in October 2013 that in January 2014, it would release its first title under their joint Disney Kingdoms imprint, Seekers of the Weird, a five-issue miniseries. And then on January 3rd of 2014, fellow Disney subsidiary Lucasfilm announced that as of 2015, Star Wars comics would be again pu- be published by Marvel. Woohoo! And then I'll just read this next one. Following the events of the company-wide crossover, Secret Wars, in 2015, a relaunched Marvel Universe began in September 2015 called the all-new, all-different Marvel. Marvel Legacy was the company's fall 2017 relaunch branding, which began that September. Books released as a part of that initiative featured lenticular variant covers that required comic book stores to double their regular issue order to be able to order the variants. The owner of two comics experience stores complained about the requiring retailers to purchase an excess of copies featuring the regular cover, which they would not be able to sell in order to acquire the more sought after variant. Marvel responded to these complaints by rescinding these ordering requirements on newer series, but maintained it on more long-running titles like The Invincible Iron Man as, sorry, like The Invincible Iron Man. As a result, MyComicShop.com and at least 70 other comic book stores boycotted these variant covers. Despite the release of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, Logan, Thor Ragnarok, and Spider-Man Homecoming in theaters, none of those characters' titles featured in the top 10 sales, and the Guardians of the Galaxy comic book series was actually canceled. Wow. At Co- Conan Properties International announced that on January 12th of 2018 that Conan would return to Marvel in early 2019. On March 1st of 2019, Serial Box, a digital book platform, announced a partnership with Marvel in which they would publish new and original series tied to a number of Marvel's popular franchises. 
In the wake of, COVID, of the COVID-19 pandemic, from March to May of 2020, Marvel and its distributor, Diamond Comic Distributors, stopped production and releasing new comic books. And then, finally, on March 25th of 2021, Marvel Comics announced that they plan to shift their direct market distribution for monthly comics and graphic novels from Diamond Comic Distributors to Penguin Random House. The change was scheduled to start on October 1st of 2021 in a multi-year partnership. The arrangement would still allow the stores the option to order comics from Diamond, but Diamond would be acting as a wholesale rather than a distributor. Yeah, and that brings us to now. Yeah. Where, you know. Doctor Strange just came out. Yeah. (laughs) I would love to see the... um, correspondence between uh comic book movies yeah. and people buying the books yeah i'd very like to see that yeah so shall we get into some fandom news emma yes let's do it okay here we go rapid fire because we have so much <laughs> yeah it's because we haven't recorded in like three weeks okay i know okay here we go Masks are now an option on board and closed transportations, including on buses and shuttles at the Walt Disney World and Disneyland Resorts. Yeah, this means that you aren't required. It's now, yes. like, your choice. They're optional. Yes. Um, I think that's what I meant to write, but... That's what it says. I just yeah. read wrong. Sure. <laughs> the Muni has announced casting for their production of Stephen Sondheim's Sweeney Todd, Carmen Cusack will be um, will star as Mrs. Lovett, Robert Cusali as Judge Turpin, and Ben Davis will take on the title role. More casting is expected to be announced at a later date. We love Carmen Cusack, though. I know. A She's going to be such a great Mrs. So Lovett. So good. Okay. Disneyland Resort has stated that it will not allow for the renewal of expiring Dream and Believe Magic Key passes as they are sold out at this time. What the heck does that mean? I don't know. I was mad while writing it. Not going to lie. What do you mean? They're sold out, so we're not going to be renewing them? (laughs) Bruh, what? (laughs) I have waited a year to get a Believe Magic Key. I can finally afford one, and now I can't even buy it? (laughs) it's our lovely disney ceo it's disney parks ceo bob chapek yeah Mm. i'm so mad keep going (laughs) i can't even talk about this anymore um due to ongoing construction on world drive near the transportation and ticket center disney's magnolia golf course will be closing indefinitely on may 9th which like there's so many golf courses on Disney <laughs> property, not going to lie. I feel like Florida is just one giant golf course. Yeah, there's like one, like 10 minutes down the road for me. <laughs> of course, there's everybody. That's actually where my course. sister's um, thespian bank was last night. That's cute. Was that the golf course? I well, at like, their like house. I feel like uh, 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 Florida is one giant mini golf course. Yeah, they have so many mini golf courses. They have, like, one that's Fantasia-themed on Disney property. Fantasia Gardens, right? Yeah. Yeah. I love how my hands go from that. <laughs> Fantasia. <laughs> she just, ah. <laughs> Jazz hands. Fantasia. <laughs> okay. Um, six Teen Edition is now available for licensing to amateur school groups in the UK and Ireland. In May, Walt Disney World will launch Power Up Days. This program will offer cast members a chance to rest, recharge, and focus on well-being and mental health. Whether you're a class of 1962 or 2022, get ready to celebrate the first ever Disneyland After Dark Grad Night Reunion at Disney's California Adventure Park. Get a quote-unquote yearbook photo, attend a pep rally, or dance the night away. Tickets on sale April 28th. Exciting news from Warner Brothers and DC at CinemaCon 2022, which is The Batman 2 starring Robert Pattinson as the famed Dark Knight, has been officially announced. So it was announced this week by director John M. Chu that the Wicked movie will be released in two parts. The films will be released a year apart, beginning with the 2024 holiday season. I don't know how I feel about that. The part one has to end with Defying Gravity, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because there's a time skip in between the two yeah. acts. 
It has to. So what are they going to fill in during the school time? Well, we'll, we'll talk about it at some point. I, but like, okay, you can, you. it's fine to crunch into the woods into one movie, but Wicked needs to. Exactly. Eh. There's some stuff also, in Wicked like, that can be cut. In game. The Batman. They were all like three hours. Three movies. hours long. Yeah. Wicked, when you see it in the theater, so I get two and a half hours. Three hour hours. Show. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. It was released in the new The Flash trailer shown at CinemaCon 2022 that Michael Shannon will return as General Zod in The Flash. But now that movie might not be made because of everything that's been happening with Ezra Miller. He's been arrested twice recently in DC and Warner Brothers are like threatening to kick him off. Man needs to get out of Hawaii is all I'm saying. <laughs> Look it up. Okay. Both of these <laughs> things have happened in Hawaii that he's like getting in trouble for. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> the third Spider-Verse film was announced. It's called <laughs> Spider-Man Beyond the Spider-Verse and it will arrive on March 29th, 2024. Disney Parks Instagram announced that they are "quote unquote" over the moon to share the that all an all new Space Mountain and Plaza are coming to Tomorrowland at Tokyo Disney Resort in 2027. Oh, that's so long so from now. Far. It's five years ago, from now. That's so long. Disney has confirmed the title of Avatar 2, which will be Avatar: The World of Water. Okay. The War of Water. Sorry, War of Water. Avatar 2. 10 years after the original Avatar came out. Yeah. Thoughts. <laughs> Annoyed. Yeah. Um, Harley Quinn spinoff Kite Man gets series order from HBO Max. The series will focus on lovable loser Kite Man and his squeeze Golden, Gla- Golden Gilder as they moonlight as criminals to support their foolish purchase of Noonan's Gotham's Tedious dive bar. HBO Max has given the show a 10 episode order. Disney Cruise Line will offer a variety of enchanting vacations in summer of 2023, including cruises to Europe, Alaska, the Bahamas, and the Caribbean. Um, the Muni has announced that Brittany Mack, Nazia Thomas, Evan Tyrone Martin, Tracy Baser, Gilbert Domley, and Nicole Michelle Haskins will star in The Moving and a Farming Tale, The Color of Purple, August 12th through 18th of 2022. The Muni and Regional Premiere is directed by Lily Ann Brown, choreographed by Brion Arzel, with music direction by Jermaine Hill. Welcome, foolish mortals, to the Haunted Mansion film coming in theaters March 10th of 2023. The film featuring Danny DeVito, Rosar rosario dawson and more will follow a doctor and her son as they move into a strangely affordable new orleans mansion i'm interested i think danny devito and rosario dawson is such a weird choice to like be the star hits of this movie i agree also okay also the eddie murphy haunted mansion movie is already right huh she has to be the doctor right yeah yeah also, the Eddie Murphy Haunted Mansion movie is already, like, perfection. Why mess with it? Exactly. <laughs> um, Magic Band Plus is coming back this year, and they've already started testing it out. And, like, the, like, 50th anniversary statues that they have of all the characters. They make noises! They make noises with the Magic Band Plus. They're so, so cute! Cool. I want, I want. Ah, oh, yes, me too. Um, Oogie Boogie Bash will return to Disney California Adventures this fall. And then Mickey's Not-So-Scary Halloween Party is finally returning to Magic Kingdom August 12th through October 31st of this year. Also, they announced the cast of Emma's favorite series, Percy Jackson. Yes. They announced the trio. Hold on. I, 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 I need to find their names. I'm, I'm so excited. I was shocked you didn't have it on here. Well, I think I kind of, because I've already started putting them on for next episode because I was going oh. them halfway in half. That's fair. Uh, we can say it twice. I'm just going to be over the moon until this show comes out, honestly. So, 
Rhea Saba Jeffries is going to be playing Annabeth in the Percy Jackson and the Olympian series. Walker Scobell will be Percy, as announced previously. And Iran Sim Hardy will be playing Grover. So our Yay. main trio has been announced, and they've already, like, gone on set. Like, they're already, like, practicing sword fighting and everything that they need to prepare for the show. And Emma's they're already gonna filming explode. TikToks together. Emma's gonna explode. <laughs> and it was the actor with like, Grover's birthday yesterday. And he was like, thank you for having, like... Or the day that it was announced was his birthday. So he was getting, like, all this, like, love and support from Percy Jackson fans on his birthday. And it just... That's really cute. It made me so happy. These 13-year-olds deserve the world. <laughs> yeah, children, the future. Woo! Woo! So, we will see you lovely, lovely people <laughs> in the outro. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Fan Fatales. We are a proud part of the Real Fans Podcast Network. That's right. And if you want to check out more shows on the network, you can always find them at rf4rm.com. Join us next week where we will be having some very special guests from the Real Fans Podcast Network as we talk about our opinions on some Disney animated films. Yes, I'm very excited. I'm very excited. (laughs) Remember to subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. We are on Apple, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. And subscribe to us on YouTube. Please leave us a review and comment down below to tell us what you thought of the show. And remember to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at FanFatalesPod for the latest updates and to possibly be featured in a future episode. Now, Emma, where can the people find you on social medias? So my Instagram and TikTok are both at SniffyEmma, which is S-N-I-P-P-Y-E-M-M-A. What about you, Gabs? I'm at Gabby Gent on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. That's G-A-B-Y-J-E-N-T. Our music is by our amazing and wonderful friend, Maddie Macon. And our editing is by the wonderful Carol Ensmeyer. As always, thanks for tuning in. Bye! Bye. The views expressed in this episode do not reflect the brand or company they're about. <laughs> <laughs>